How y'all doing? I'm Carl Falk. This is the Falcon Around Podcast. As you probably know, I used to be a radio guy. Now I'm a podcast guy. And through the beauty of the pandemic, we do this from my home each week instead of our beautiful studio. Hopefully, we will soon be back in that studio. Obviously, now we don't know what's going on with the pandemic and we don't know what's going on with the immediate future of anything, let alone sports. Certainly going to talk a lot about the effect of the world now on sports today. But I want to talk about some things that are actually going on. I want to start with the Last Dance documentary that's been going on on ESPN, the story of Michael Jordan's final season with the Chicago Bulls. And this has been a television event that has gripped everybody. I think there's a couple reasons for it. Obviously, the pandemic and the fact that there are no live sports, we're desperate to watch anything. We want sports in the worst possible way. So therefore, we're certainly going to find a way to enjoy our sports going forward. Anything. Give us something. Give us a morsel. The Korean Baseball League has signed a deal with ESPN, and people are freaking out. Oh, Excellent. I can, I can watch baseball. I'm a Mets fan. I don't know if I'll watch the Korean Baseball League. Maybe if I'm flipping around and it's on, I'll tune it in. But it's going to be strange for me. But the last dance is something that I lived through. I knew about most of the things I was aware of. And Michael Jordan is a mythical figure. I don't want to say legendary because I think legendary is too light. Mythical is better. We're surprised, I think, when we see video of Michael Jordan missing a free throw, missing a last second shot, being something other than perfection. And in last week's episode dealt with a lot of that. It, it's funny, Michael, his competitive nature and how he got himself psyched up for things. And this week's episode dealt with a lot of that. Patrick Ewing and the Knicks and how Jordan hated the Knicks. And for Knicks fans, it was a uh, good reminiscing part of, remember when the Knicks were good? They actually were. The Knicks were a decent team for a minute. Yeah, no, that was real. And then you see Charles Smith miss four layups in a row. Gets blocked on a couple, but either way, you know where I'm going. It, It was the agony and defeat, both. Agony of defeat and the joy of victory, both for Knicks fans. Hey, we used to be good. Oh, Charles Smith missed another layup. Great. That's awesome. But then you have the Clyde Drexler thing. And, and, and Clyde Drexler and Jordan, to me, will always be intertwined because Clyde Drexler was a similar type player. Both were two guards. Both were tall, athletic, could do things with great flair. Both came out of storied college program. So when it got to the NBA, we all knew about them. Clyde, of course, being on Five Slamma Jamma with the Houston Cougars back in the day and MJ at Carolina. But the two of them were similar. And Portland, in the year that Jordan was drafted, had the second pick. Number one, Akeem Olajuwon, of course, went to the Houston Rockets. And then Portland at number two could have taken Michael Jordan. But they had Clyde Drexler, who was taken the year before that. And Drexler was a similar type player and a really good player. So do you want duplicity in Jordan and Drexler? And that was the question at the time. And remember, this is an era of basketball where everyone was building through the post. And you needed a big man, and Portland didn't have that. So they went with Sam Bowie out of Kentucky who ended up breaking his legs 87 times throughout his career, and it didn't work out as well. And, of course, then Jordan goes three to the Bulls, and the rest is history. Well, when Jordan and Drexler come up against each other, people were comparing the two of them, as I just did, and it pissed Jordan off something fierce. How dare you compare Clyde Drexler to me? That's an insult. And these are the things whether it's that or Dan Marley, Jerry Krause, anything Jerry Krause did, Jordan and Pippen, by the way, hated. Dan Marley was a very good player for the Rockets at that time, was supposedly an excellent defender in Krause's mind. So what's Jordan do? Makes a point of going out to light him up. 
Jordan's always given credit for his competitive nature and always given credit for his single mindedness. I was thinking about this and I have been since I've been watching the documentary and I came up with a thing that is interesting to me. WWTD. What would Twitter do? What would Twitter do to Michael Jordan? Michael Jordan had some things go on that haven't been really well portrayed, in my opinion, in the documentary. Look, I love this thing. The, the footage is great. And I said last week, nobody played basketball cooler than Michael Jordan ever. It's never been done. He just has an amazing flair and ability to do things that most other players haven't. Nobody played the game with the fire of Jordan and the effectiveness and athleticism of Jordan. So all of those things together made him the global icon that he was. And we're now looking back, and we always do this. We always think about things in the positive sense when they're gone. Your old job, man, I really liked working there. That boss, he was a great guy. This person, that was a great guy. Your old girlfriend, who when you broke up with her, you couldn't be happier. Now you think back, man, we had some good times. Remember that? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We always think of the positive. Read an obituary. The guy might have been the biggest asshole to walk the face of the earth. Yet in his obituary, you make him out to be the second coming. We don't speak ill of the dead. We don't speak ill of the past. We generally remember it only through rose-colored glasses. And that's how we're doing with Michael Jordan. And there's not much negative for Jordan. But there are some things. And if Jordan played now, in the era that we're in in sports, or we were before all this happened, I think the memories of Michael Jordan would be far different than they are now. LeBron James has had about as squeaky clean of an image and a great career as we could imagine in the Twitter era. Jordan would not have gotten off so easily. Jordan wasn't always a great teammate. Jordan wasn't always a great guy. Jordan had some things go on that we saw in this past week's episode that made it like he's vindictive and spiteful. And while we can make the rationale that, yeah, that's what drove him to greatness, I don't know if that's the case. I really don't. I think Jordan is going to be great anyway. Jordan's competitiveness was something that would both make him great and get him in trouble. And there were a couple figures along the way that you saw Jordan get mixed up with, and then Jordan was a mentor. Listen to this sound clip after some allegations had come out with Jordan or fr- about Jordan, and he hadn't talked to the media in a while. And at the same part of this sound clip, Jordan, of course, is the guy talking in the sunglasses, if you don't recognize him. His ability to be a mentor to a young Kobe Bryant. Check this out. At that point, Michael provided a lot of guidance for me. Like, I had a question about shooting his turnaround shot. So I asked him about it. And, you know, he gave me a great detailed answer. But on top of that, he said, if you ever need anything, give me a call. It's like my big brother. You know, I truly hate having discussions about who would win one-on-one. And you're a fan saying, hey, Kobe, you beat Michael one-on-one. I feel like, yo, what you get from me is from him. I don't get five championships here without him because he guided me so much and gave me so much great advice. For the public, do you have a gambling problem? No, I I enjoy it. It's a hobby. If I had a problem, I'd be starving. I'd be hawking this watch. My championship rings, I would sell my house. I would do this. The sunglasses are classic for MJ there. And that interview was the first interview he did after what amounted to about a two-week media boycott. Jordan at the time had taken a trip to Atlantic City in between games of the playoff, was seen in the casino late night at 3 a.m. And of course, 
you can't talk about Jordan and his career and the controversies without bringing up the fact that it's always been theorized or rumored, however you want to say it, that Michael Jordan's baseball hiatus was more of a suspension than it was of a quick retirement, I'm going to try something else. Jordan at the time had had some questions raised about his gambling, which he answered there. He didn't have a gambling problem. He had a competitiveness problem. Well, gamblers generally have a problem when they run out of money. Jordan's worth $2 billion now. It's tough to run out of money when you're worth a couple billion dollars. And I think that's something that gets glossed over a little bit. Jordan, at the time, had some acquaintances that were a little sketchy. Slim Bowler was a guy who he played a lot of golf with. Jordan had written him a check for $57,000. Bowler was convicted and did time for money laundering and among other things. And was a felon. And Jordan has a document and has to testify in court. So the NBA called him in about this. He also had a guy, Richard Equinas, who wrote a book, Michael and Me, who detailed Jordan's gambling forays. Jordan was legendary. There was the scene this week, and this was great. It, it shows the other side of Michael Jordan, the human side, with a Chicago narcotics officer who died just recently, John Wozniak, and he and Jordan were playing quarters. And this guy had an Afro mullet, if you will, blonde mane, and had swagger and did the shrug to Michael Jordan after beating him in quarters. It was great. It was great to see. And his son interviewed, said that his father had died. This is John Wozniak, a decorated Chicago cop, had died just recently. Ended up working full-time for Jordan when Jordan went to play baseball. He was full-time member of the security detail, and worked for Jordan up until he couldn't. And then MJ continued to pay him until the day he died. MJ is very much a multifaceted guy, and we're seeing that in this documentary. We're seeing a guy who is as charismatic and was the ultimate company spokesman, Be Like Mike, the Gatorade commercial, played prominently. And yet Mike is sitting alone in a hotel room smoking a cigar that you look at and he can't go anywhere. He's trapped in his own world. And it's strange to see all of these different sides of a man that we all thought we knew well. And I'm sure many people are finding out things that they're very surprised about. You know, Jordan's got the ultimate swag. He, he is the king of swag. And when you see the swagger, he just reads it. Who else could drive around in a red Range Rover with a vanity plate to train? Seriously? I mean, that's MJ. And who else smokes heaters on the way to a game? Now, the NBA apparently in the 90s was all about scars. Nowadays, it's all about the weed. So I guess it's better back then. But I, I don't know. I'm not a smoker. So take this for what it's worth. If I smoke a cigar, I feel like my body's on fire. I'm not certainly get ready to go run basketball games. I'm not smoking a cigar on the way to a game. MJ did it all the time in the locker rooms. It was crazy. And then, of course, you get into the dream team stuff. And we bring back our favorite villain, Isaiah Thomas, for this part of the documentary this week. Isaiah, of course, was left off the dream team. And I've said this many times, whether it be on this podcast or on my radio show when I had it, that the dream team is the single greatest team that's ever been assembled. There were 12 members of this team. Only Christian Leitner was not a Hall of Famer. And Christian Leitner was chosen, controversially, I might add, over Shaq. He was the college kid, not Shaq. They were both drafted the same year. Shaq should have been the pick, and Shaq would have made it 12 for 12 Hall of Famers. Magic, Bird, Malone, Stockton, Pippen, Barkley, Chris Mullen, Ewing Robinson. It, it just... An unbelievable assembly of talent and names and, and legends. And the practices before these games 
were legendary. They did a couple things. They they went to Monte Carlo to train, and that was pretty cool. And the practices there were supposedly off the chart. There's talk, and they got into a little bit on Sunday night on the documentary about the greatest game nobody saw. And it was these players in a scrimmage and going at it. And they did go at it. And that's what, when you've got not only the collection of talent, but the personalities to go with it. Larry Bird, one of the greatest trash talkers of all time and certainly as clutch of a player as ever to play. Magic Johnson, who would run everything from his mouth to the game to all the things in between. Jordan, Drexler, Barkley. Nobody was willing to take a back seat. They all understood Jordan was the man. And Jordan was the only guy who started all eight games in the Olympics. I found that interesting. Jordan wasn't the leading scorer on the Dream Team. Charles Barkley was. And I think it's good to see Barkley get some love because I think now when we look at him on TV, we forget how great of a player Charles Barkley was. But the one guy that wasn't there was Isaiah Thomas. And frankly, Isaiah Thomas should have been there. If you were around at that time, and I certainly was, and you followed basketball and knew the NBA, there's no question Isaiah Thomas is one of the 12 best players in the NBA. But word had it at the time, and it's somewhat contradictory now, that Jordan wouldn't have played if Isaiah did. And in the documentary, Jordan and Rod Thorne, who was then the Bulls general manager, vice president, or was a vice president for the NBA, they said that Jordan had nothing to do with it. Now, in a book written by Jack McCollum in, back in 2012, Rod Thorne told Jack McCollum that Jordan said he wouldn't play if Isaiah did play. So there's some contradictory there from Jordan. And again, WWTD, what would Twitter do? You know, in hindsight, these books, the book by Jack McCollum, the book by Steve Smith, the Jordan rules. If, if these things came out now, after watching this, I think people would start to see a little bit more in depth. You know, go back to the gambling. There were a lot of rumors and innuendo and none ever substantiated. Not only was Jordan suspended by the NBA, that potentially the murder of his father may have had something to do with Jordan's gambling habits. Never substantiated, but again, a rumor that was out there. And these rumors pre-Twitter kind of went up in the air and fell to the ground harmlessly. In the Twitter age, I don't think that would have happened. And Michael Jordan was a benefit of when he played. But back to the Dream Team. This was as great of a team as ever assembled. And, and Jordan then was the young guy. Remember, this is the 92 team. Jordan was at his rise. Magic had already stepped away from the game, and they glossed over this as well because of his HIV situation. And, and that's one of those things that was an earth-shattering moment in sports, yet we kind of gloss over it. Larry Bird was at the end of his rope. His back was shot at that point. Wasn't the same player, but still a great player. But Jordan was the guy going forward, and he was the guy that all of the marketing was centered around. And here's where the marketing dollars and all the things that Jordan did off the floor got real interesting. When, when Jordan, and I thought this was great, he wanted to be an Adidas guy. How many Adidas executives were like, oh, we need to see this again. Back then, Converse was the main shoe in the NBA. The Converse weapon. Magic, Bird, Drexler, all wore Converse. They weren't about to pay some young kid, Michael Jordan, coming out of Carolina, a bunch of money. But Nike was a small running shoe company that decided it needed a face. And they went along with their agent, with Jordan's agent, David Falk, and they marketed the heck out of them. They had hoped in the first four years of the deal, they would get $3 million at the end of year one. 
Three million dollars in sales at the end of year one would have been great. They ended up with a hundred. I'm sorry. By the end of year four, three million dollars. They ended up with 126 million dollars in sales at the end of year one, and the Jordan brand was born. And it's been a huge, huge success. It is Nike. Michael Jordan is Nike. If you think about it, he made that brand. He made that company. And he did so because of a lot of great timing, A, B, his ability to be likable, and C, the timing of when he was playing was before Twitter. What would Twitter do? Nobody took shots at Jordan. This is back when the press still protected the players for the most part. Jordan wouldn't have been protected in today's day and age. On the floor, he would have been. He certainly wasn't protected on the floor back then. But I think it's great to see all of these different angles. And the Kobe Bryant part of it, which we heard Kobe in that soundbite, to listen to Kobe now, to see Kobe now is strange. As somebody who, you know, again, I'm an old guy. I remember when Kobe was 17 years old at the high school gym, sunglasses on his head, cocky, taking his game to the NBA for going college. And I'm thinking, look at this kid. And as Kobe morphed through his career, and we saw it go from the four air balls against Utah to the five championships, to hear his voice now that he's passed is somewhat haunting because I think Kobe had a lot more to give, not on the floor, but kind of as a sage. And he was becoming that guy, both to women's basketball players, and he was a great mentor, not only to his daughter and that team, but to a lot of women's college basketball players. And, and that's phenomenal to me, stepping out of what you're used to and into a different genre. That, that's what makes people great. And that was what Kobe was doing. But he also, with the young players in the league, he would talk to them the way Jordan talked to him. And it's that pay it down effect. But to hear, hear Kobe was a little strange because, again, he, you know, 2020 hasn't been a great year for any of us. And when Kobe died in a helicopter crash earlier this year, it took that voice and wisdom away from all of us. So to hear it, very, very different. So great stuff in the documentary. I can't wait till this week. We're going to get to hear from Steve Kerr about the time that Jordan punched him in practice. A lot of other things going on. I was glad we finally got to hear about from Tony Kukoc. I was afraid they had frozen him out. Uh, Carmen Electric didn't make an appearance this week, but I read this stat. Carmen Electra last week, we talked about how great she still looks and the story about her and Rodman. After she was on the week after, she was searched 1.7 million times on Pornhub. You think we're a little bored and need to get back to work during this pandemic? 1.7 million. Yeah, we need to get back to work. So that's the last dance part of the show. We had another loss just yesterday. Don Shula. The Dolphins' great coach passed away at age 90. Bill Belichick doesn't get a lot of credit for speaking to the media, but this summer when they did the the 100 greatest players or greatest players of all time, Belichick was part of that, and he was great. He was really good. Listen to Bill Belichick talk about Don Shula. Becomes the all-time winningest coach in the history of the National Football League. 347 wins. Let's start with that. Right. <laughs> it's a lot. You know, I remember Coach Shula. I would I would watch uh, Coach Shula's TV show every week uh, with the Baltimore Colts uh, growing up in Annapolis and. Uh, Corralling the Colts was the was the show, and <laughs> I always look forward to Coach Shula's breakdowns and and uh, his interviews with the uh, the star players there. We started out, we had some great licks hit. This is what we want to see: great by the defense, great by the offense. I think Coach Shula really kind of set the standard for for all of it. Seventeen and zero, right there, the perfect season, the only perfect season 
in the history of the NFL. Look, I was never a fan of the Dolphins popping champagne when the last team loses every year. But 17-0, that's one of those things that you hang your hat on and nobody else can beat it. Somebody may tie it eventually. may happen. But the likelihood in this day and age of free agency and parity driven rules is l- less likely to happen. He had great players. We coach more Hall of Famers than any coach ever. And if you start to think about, you know, we always do the Mount Rushmore of the NFL, the, the greatest quarterbacks, and who were you, you here for? Mount Rushmore of coaches in the NFL, for me, start with Vince Lombardi. And I think you have to have Vince Lombardi because at the infancy of the league, Vince Lombardi was the coach. Don Shula, the all-time wins leader, in addition to all the other things I just mentioned. Bill Belichick, who's won more Super Bowls than anybody. And my fourth, and this may be a bit of a homer pick, was Tom Landry. Landry, who went 20 years without a losing season and I think made the playoffs 18 of those 20 and won a couple Super Bowls with the Dallas Cowboys. Now, I've seen some people say Bill Walsh would be in that group, and Bill Walsh was certainly a brilliant coach and changed the NFL for the positive. My argument there is George Seifert won a championship with Bill Walsh's team as well. So I think that takes away a little bit from it. But Don Shula, certainly a great, and you know, from here we are in Western New York, Bill's Dolphins rivalry was the rivalry for years. And that was something that back in the day when the Bills were going to the Super Bowls, Bills Dolphins was must see, must see TV. And Shula and Marv Levy, they were part of that. And they were a huge part of that. So the NFL certainly lost a a very big piece of their history yesterday. And that is a, a terrible, terrible thing. The NFL schedule is going to be released on Thursday night. This is one of those things that you look at and go, wait, schedule? We're in a pandemic. Nobody's playing sports. How are they going to release the schedule? The NFL has been undeterred. They've been criticized and then applauded in hindsight, both for free agency going on on time and the draft going on on time. And when these things were happening, people were freaking out. No, you can't do it. We're in a pandemic. You can't have the NFL has been the one league that's continued to sail on. And they're going to do so again with the schedule release. And there are a lot of parts of the schedule that people get excited about. When you're a fan of a team, many people will say, I'm going to pick a game a year, go to a different stadium. This is when you get the first look at, okay, who's in Nashville? I want to go see the city of Nashville, or I want to go to Miami and see my team play. When are they there? I want to make reservations and all the things that go along with it. And I don't know this year that we'll be allowed to go to games, especially initially, how they're going to situate that. There's so many questions that need to be answered before we can get to those sort of plans. The NFL has announced that there are no games out of country, no European games this year, no game in Mexico. And for that, I applaud them. And frankly, I hope they never go back. I've always hated the London games, and I hate the game in Mexico City. I just don't like that we fund stadiums, we get tax dollars back from those stadiums to help pay for all the things that we give the teams and their owners, and then the NFL decides they're going to take a home game and play it in a different spot. That's not something that sits well with me. The only good part about it is if you're a football junkie like me, is a lot of times you'll have a 9 o'clock game on a Sunday morning. And then the 1 o'clock games, the 4.30 games, and then the 8 o'clock games. So literally from 9 in the morning till about midnight, you can watch football. And that's obviously a great thing. And if you don't agree with that, you're probably not listening to this podcast anyway. So that's fine. It's just one of those things that's fantastic. But I don't like selling out the true fans to try to attract other fans that probably don't care anyway. It's just not something I'm a fan of. And if you're a Bills fan, I think this part of it is good news. I do think the Bills were likely to be the opponent in Mexico City of the Arizona Cardinals. The Cardinals were slated to play there. 
Bills. Now a team that is on the rise and a team that is somewhat marketable. And, and we saw people get interested in the Bills for the first time in a long time last year. That likely would have been a destination for them. The primetime games are something else that people look at when the schedule comes out. Who gets the most? And, you know, there's always going to be the teams that are on there, the traditional teams of Dallas and, and, and the Raiders. No matter the record, they're always going to be on there. The big market teams, the Rams, the Jets, the Giants, they're going to be on the primetime games. It's the smaller market teams that if you're not good, you're not there. Last year, the Bills were the only team in the NFL not given a primetime game. Now, they were given a Dallas Cowboys Thanksgiving Day game, and they went down there and kicked the crap out of the Cowboys. So they announced their presence. They were then flexed to a Sunday night game. They went to Pittsburgh on that Sunday night game and kicked the crap out of the Steelers. And then they somehow lost the playoff game that they won, but whatever. They didn't win the game. They were just the better team on the field that day and found a way to lose the game. But all of these things changed the national narrative towards the Buffalo Bills. Locally, your local fan base is always going to think your team is better than they are. But nationally, everyone got to see what Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean are building in Buffalo. And I think this year, you can expect to see at least three primetime games. I, I do believe that that the Bills will be on prime time at least three times. So it'll be fun to watch how that plays out. It, it's just one of those things that you look forward to as a fan. Now, right now, as fans, we're looking forward to anything. But the schedule release, it's much more about when you play somebody as opposed to who you play. You already know who you're playing. And the NFL schedule is all about when you play them. It's not timing as far as the calendar, timing as far as the football team. A lot of teams this year will struggle early because of the lack of ability to implement an offseason program where you may have a new coach, new quarterback, things like that. It's going to be a much different season when it comes to trying to get ready early in the season. So I think there's those things to be looking at when the schedule comes out. Just remember this. When the schedule comes out Thursday, don't go through the schedule and say, okay, team A is going to be blah, 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 10 and 6, 11 and 5, 4 and 12. Don't do that. We don't know enough about these teams yet. We haven't been through training camp. If there's a training camp, we don't know what injuries are going to happen. Save your predictions until a couple weeks before the season. That's when we have a lot more information and you're likely to be a lot more accurate with your predictions. Nothing's more important in the NFL than the quarterback position. We see it every week or every year with the draft. Teams trying to get up to get their quarterback. Teams trying to find the quarterback of the future. And if you start looking at the quarterback situation in the NFL, it's more unique now than it's ever been. The NFL, because of medical training and, and physical health of players and their ability to take care of themselves, guys are playing longer. So guys like Tom Brady and Drew Brees playing into their 40s, Aaron Rodgers in his mid-30s, Ben Roethlisberger, Philip Rivers, assuming Roethlisberger is healthy, are going to be in their late 30s. And these are all elite quarterbacks. I started looking at the quarterback situation this week because the Dallas Cowboys went out and signed Andy Dalton, theoretically to be Dak Prescott's backup. Prescott, of course, has a franchise tag slapped on him by the team, hasn't signed a contract. The franchise tag would pay Prescott $31 million a year. So I started looking at which teams are in the best shape with their quarterback situation. And... I found some interesting things that if I was to project next year's quarterbacks, the 2021 starting quarterbacks throughout the league, I come out with 13 of the 32 teams that I could with certainty tell you who their quarterback will be. 13. You know, because let's face it, are we certain Tom Brady's going to play two years in Tampa? Are we certain Aaron Rodgers is going to be the Green Bay Packers starter next year? Same with Roethlisberger, Breeze. 
There are a lot of questions, and even teams with good quarterback situations. You don't know. Now, in Kansas City, I know Patrick Mahomes will be the starting quarterback next year. I know Lamar Jackson and Deshaun Watson are going to be there. The young guys will get another year. Josh Allen, Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold. The guys who were drafted last year, Kyler Murray, are going to get those opportunities. But only 13 teams, by my account, I could say with certainty, we know who their quarterback is next year. And if you look at those, nine of the 13 are first and second year quarterbacks, guys who were drafted in the last couple years. You add to that guys like Mahomes and Watson, who are in their still rookie contract, 11 of the 13 certain starters for next year, by my account, are under their rookie deal. That's what's wild to me. Only Carson Wentz and Russell Wilson are quarterbacks outside of their rookie deal that I could say with certainty will be their starting quarterback next year. And, of course, I'm sure there's some of you pointing out that Philadelphia just drafted Jalen Hurts. I, I, I like Jalen Hurts, and I do think he will eventually be the starter in Philly. But I think that's years off. Carson Wentz is a great, great young player. And if he stays healthy, he's going to remind us of how good he can be. So I'm, I'm certain of that. But there are tiers of quarterbacks. There's the quarterback room right now. And I'm not looking at just the starters. I'm looking at the quarterback room that are fantastic. You look at what, what New Orleans has in their quarterback room. They've got a Hall of Fame starter in Drew Brees. Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill backing him up. Three quarterbacks that if there are injuries, the season's going to continue on. And there are a few rooms that are like that. I really like the 49ers quarterback room. Jimmy Garoppolo may not be a Hall of Fame caliber quarterback, but he's damn good. Nick Mullins and C.J. Beathard have both showed they can play. If they have injuries, their season goes along. The one quarterback room that interests me more than any other is, again, go back to the New England Patriots. Brady's in Tampa. Brady took... All that he had, left it in New England. We'll see what happens in, in, in Tampa. But the Patriots have Jared Stidham and Brian Hoyer. They didn't go out and draft anybody. Cam Newton's still available, which I'm shocked that move hasn't been made, that they haven't tried to sign Cam. And Cam has said he's not going to sign anywhere as a backup. Well, what's got me thinking about Jared Stidham is a couple things. Remember when the Packers decided that they were done with Brett Favre and they were going to give a young kid that they had drafted a few years earlier a chance and Aaron Rodgers and people lost their mind. And the one thing I always thought about when that happened was the Packers see Aaron Rodgers every day in practice. They know what they have in Aaron Rodgers. They wouldn't move on from Brett Favre, who still had years left, as we saw, if they weren't confident and what they had in Aaron Rodgers. Is this possibly a similar situation in New England? Is it possible that they've seen enough in Jared Stidham, knowing that Brady's near the end anyway, that the time was now to make that move? Remember, this is a team that had Drew Bledsoe, was a great quarterback at the time, get hurt, and Brady made everybody forget about Drew Bledsoe. They won a championship, not because of Tom Brady, but with Tom Brady that first year. That was a defensive-oriented team that got good enough play from its quarterback position to win a championship. New England's defense was as good as any in the league last year. It will be just as good, I think, this year. Question is, can the offense hold up their point, their part? I almost look at this as a similar situation going forward. Does Belichick believe that much in Stidham that he thinks he's got a team that can win, not because of their quarterback, but with their quarterback? It's going to be a lot of fun to watch how that plays out this year. The rookie quarterbacks are going to be fun to watch. Keep an eye on the teams that don't have 
anybody worthwhile as a backup, and there are a lot of them. I mentioned Tom Brady. Tom Brady's backup is Blaine Gabbert. Brady's 42 years old, and he's been very durable through his career. But Blaine Gabbert, if he's the quarterback in, in Tampa, Tampa's not a playoff team. If Brady's the quarterback, I think they are. But keep an eye on things like that. Russell Wilson plays every, every down of every game. Anthony Gordon is his backup. I don't see that happening. You know, there are a lot of good backup quarterbacks, and that's look at what the Cowboys did. If Andy Dalton's Dak Prescott's backup, which should be, something happens to Prescott, Andy Dalton can win you football games. Pat Mahomes got hurt this year, hurt his ankle or hurt his knee. Chad Henney's his backup. Henney's not a great player, but you can win games with him, especially on that team. So it's very important to have a good backup quarterback and a serviceable one, especially if you're a team that thinks you're going to win games and compete compete for a championship this coming year. So the quarterback situation, always interesting. Never too early to talk about it and things like that. I want to close this week by talking about a couple things that really kind of bug me a little bit. The first is that the spring sports were canceled this past week in New York State. And that's no surprise. We knew this was coming as a result of the pandemic. But I think when you look at what these kids have just had ripped out from under them, it's disappointing. If you're an older person like me or somebody who's out of school, you look back fondly at your high school sports careers, times, some of the great times, just going down the bus, going to games, competing with your friends, playing that one last ride. And when you're going through high school, when you're a freshman, you're at the bottom of the totem pole, and then you move your way up. Or when you're a senior, you finally made it. And the seniors this year, they're getting ripped off, whether it be in high school or in college. In college, you're missing all the fun that go along with being a senior and finishing the grind of your education, looking forward to go out into the real world, the fun of all the things that went on with that, your senior weeks, your all the different things. People in those situations are getting ripped off from. And, and I feel bad because those are some very fond memories of my life, both college and high school. And whether it be athletics or social clubs, whatever the case may be, they're losing now. And it's never going to be replaced. I know many things we talk about never going to be the same. The people who are seniors in college and high school are missing out on something this year that all the rest of us got to experience. And they'll never be able to make it up. And it's extremely unfortunate. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them and let anyone in that position who listens to the podcast know, I'm thinking of you, you have my sympathies, but don't worry, it will get better. And then there's one other part. There were a few more defections this week in local media. The Democrat and Chronicle moved on from their sports editor, Steve Bradley. Steve's a good friend and did a great job for 20-plus years at the DNC. Just Sucks to see a great talent like that go. Leo Roth, who wrote for the DNC for almost 40 years, covered the Bills and did many other things. As nice of a man as you will ever meet is no longer writing for the paper. Our our local paper has become a pamphlet. There are only two sports writers left over there by my count. It's not a good thing. It's unfortunate local journalism taking a big hit. And then one other thing, one of my former workers in the radio station, Paulie Guglielmo, as talented of a radio guy as you'll ever meet, was somewhat undone by some things in his radio career. I'm not going to get into it because it's not my place. But Paulie, being a smart, talented guy, had a side gig that's now become a full-time gig. Guglielmo sauce, spaghetti sauce. Pasta sauces. They're great. And he's made the big leap at a time when many people are hoping their business will reopen at some point. Paulie's all in on a business that I hope 
someday we'll talk about I knew him when, because this is a great guy, a great talent. And unfortunately, once again, we local consumers of media won't get to experience. So three men who have given us a lot to listen and read over the past couple of years and several years for some of the guys no longer providing that and just wanted to give them a bit of a shout out. So thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great week. Enjoy the schedule release on Thursday. Last dance on Sunday. We'll be back next week talking all about it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great week.